So how did we come to tonight's topic? Well, I've been interested in security and privacy and identity for a long time, and I've actually had a couple of jobs where that was relevant, but I noticed that Bakai's programs haven't been featuring this topic as much as we might with all the talent we have in the area. And I also realized that passwords are a pain in the butt, and now there's all, I, I hope I can use that language with you, um, and now there are various other forms of authentication that are becoming available and popular, and I thought this is a great time to think about what designers and their pals in other parts of the organization would need to know in order to provide usable authentication. And luckily, in our area, we have somebody who is not only an expert, but worked on a national project, a project with national scope and reach and authentication authenticity, that's different from authentication, but not unrelated. And so um, that's why I wanted to invite Jim Fenton to come and familiarize us with some of the work that he's been doing in connection with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, a federal agency that put out a report a little while ago, and I bet none of you has read it yet. I haven't read the whole thing, although I have browsed through it. So I'll let Jim familiarize us all with some of the highlights of that report and the other work he's been doing in this area. Jim. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Nancy. Um, pl pleased to be here. This is my first experience with Bay Kai, so um, you know, please jump up and down if I'm uh, violating any of the social norms of this organization. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do with uh, authentication is to try and make it so that it's something that people can actually accomplish. Um, if, you know, I think everybody here, uh, how, ma how, how many of you have more than a couple of dozen passwords? Just like everybody? Okay. Um, you know, you're, you're told, um, <coughs> uh, that you should memorize these, they should be complex, don't write them down, all, all of these sorts of things. And we've really given people a, um, an impossible task. And as a result, they cheat. And some of the things that they do to cheat are okay, and some of the things that they do to cheat are really bad from a security standpoint. And so it's really important that we address the usability characteristics of, of authentication, of signing into services, websites. I'll, I'll probably use the term services, but I mean websites, applications, you know, any place that you need to prove who you are. So um, as, as Nancy mentioned, I'm a consultant for the National Institute of Standards and Technology working on this. Um, it, it, the focus of my work has been primarily the revision of uh, a standard that I'm going to be talking about here um, that uh, is, is really applicable to government services, um, but is used a lot elsewhere as well. The, um, uh, I should point out that I'm, as a consultant, what I say here is my own opinion, uh, and it is not the official position of NIST, uh, because it can't be. And, um, I'm going to focus, I'm going to give a different talk than I would normally give about this standard because we're focusing on the usability aspects. Um, so rather than focusing on, on strictly the security, which is really the primary focus of the documents that, that we've been revising, I'm going to be pointing at this from a usability standpoint. But as we'll see, the, uh, the, the two are not unrelated. <coughs> So um, this document, uh, this is the, you know, kind of what the, the front of it looks like. It's very exciting. Um, is, it's called Digital Identity Guidelines. And like I mentioned, it's intended uh, for use by the government. Um, but what we did, uh, and this is, this is like the, the fourth edition of it. Uh, uh, this is 63-3, so it's Rev 3 of, of, the, of the document. But we've um, made... <clears throat> a fairly substantial number of changes to it in, in this revision. Uh, it's a, um, a four-volume set of documents uh, now, rather than a single thick document. 
uh, because what we wanted to do was to break things down and have people able to access the portions of it that are relevant to them. So the, 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 we have a top level document here which is called 800-63-3 and it's sort of an introduction to the, to the other documents but it also contains some information about how much authentication strength do you need for a particular application. You know, if this is a, uh, a financial application, uh, do you need two-factor authentication here? Do you need really, you know, maybe hardware-based two-factor authentication? Um, uh, or maybe for a, a situation where, maybe a medical application where you're prescribing a controlled substance, what do you need there? So those sorts of things are contained in the top-level document. And then with the, the three sub-documents deal with uh, individual sections. So 63A here is enrollment and identity proofing, which is <coughs> identity proofing is kind of a maybe an awkward term, but it refers to the process by which somebody that's coming in and getting registered with an identity system proves that they're a particular carbon-based life form. Um, you know, am I you know, how do you, how do you make sure that at registration time somebody isn't posing as somebody else? And uh, so there's a, you know, the whole, whole set of procedures here around things like, um, uh, you know, what kind of documentation should you produce? You know, birth certificates, driver's licenses, um, uh, bank statements, uh, utility bills, all sorts of things like that that can be used as evidence here and how do you use that to associate it with an online account. That's a significant problem for a lot of online services because you don't really, I mean, you, you know that there's you know, maybe somebody with a particular Twitter handle but you don't know unless maybe they've got that blue check mark um, uh, that, that it's actually a particular person or even a person at all, I suppose. Um, 63B, which is gonna be the, the, the document that I'm gonna focus on the most here, is the one that deals with actually signing into uh, a website or a service. So this deals with the different ways that you can authenticate, uh, combinations of those, and uh, three different levels of uh, authentication strength that can be used in, in different situations and what the requirements are for each of those. And then the third one, which I won't talk about very much at all, federation and assertions, this, this talks about cases where you you might sign into one place and then use that identity in multiple other places. And so those are when the, the place that you sign into is said to make an assertion of your identity to some other site. And, and uh, in, in, in these situations, which really are kind of more the future because with, with federation and assertions, you have the opportunity to maybe have fewer online accounts and fewer things that you need to manage by yourself. <clears throat> so there were several motivations for updating these documents. One was just that it was time. Um, we revise these documents every few years. Uh, and you know the reason for that is because uh, technology changes. And in the case of a security document, you have to consider the fact that the attackers are getting more sophisticated as well. So, so the you know, requirements have to, get, have to get stricter or we have to learn from what, what some of the problems have been. There's another speci more specific reason which is quoted here <clears throat> is that um, uh, a couple of years ago there was this executive order that was issued which said that all agencies, meaning federal agencies here, making personal data accessible require multiple factors of authentication. So that mean, this executive order basically changed, basically gave us direction that we needed to change the requirements for accessing personal information on government websites. And also an, an, an effective identity proofing process because that's the other potential weakness. If you don't, if you don't register people securely then uh, having all of the authentication in the world isn't, isn't necessarily going to help. <clears throat> but what this recognizes is that 
the users are different than they used to be. Uh, standards such as this used to focus largely on government applications where there were government employees that were accessing government systems. <clears throat> now there's much more where citizens or, or other residents, pe just people in general, are accessing uh, government sites in order to maybe check their social security balance, in order to talk to the IRS, in order, you know, maybe they're a, a veteran and they need to uh, manage their uh, veterans administration uh, things. Um, <clears throat> so, so really we have a much wider variety of, of uh, users uh, ranging everywhere from very sophisticated, we might have physicians that are using online systems in order to authorize dispensing a controlled substance to a patient. Um, and we have homeless people, which might be, you know, some of those folks from the, um, some of those veterans, when they come back, they come back kind of broken and they often end up homeless. And those are the ones that need the services a lot. And so we want to make sure that authentication, both, in, both from the standpoint of enrollment and signing in to, to, to services, is available and accessible to all of these kinds of people. Um, it's, it's, it's not just federal employees anymore. <clears throat> so in this revision of 800-63, we engaged some folks at NIST that are themselves uh, you know, specialists in, in human factors. And if you look at the covers of the documents, you will see that there's, there are specific people that are called out as usability editors of the, uh, of the documents or usability authors. Uh, we, we put in a, a specific usability consideration section in each of the three A, B, and C volumes in order to, uh, in order to discuss that in, in more detail. In addition to which, um, the uh, uh, specific requirements were informed by the usability considerations. So uh, wh whereas the usability considerations are kind of just sort of explaining the things that uh, people implementing services might want to think about, um, we also have, in the process of creating the document, um, made uh, changes to requirements in order to improve usability, and I'll be talking about quite a few of those. Um, so, in addition to you know usability, which you know you think of as sort of how how easy is it to log in that sort of thing, a couple of related uh, concepts that that I'll be addressing are accessibility, which of course is uh, the case where somebody who has a, a, some sort of a disability, are they able to authenticate successfully? Maybe they have impaired vision, maybe they have a dexterity problem, um, those, those sorts of things. And, and availability. Um, there, are, there are situations where you know, maybe on, on particular classes of devices you can't authenticate, or maybe in particular locations because you may not have all the telecommunication services that you'd like to have um, or, or that you're accustomed to having in the city. And, and also with availability, of course, you know, we think about things like first responders. Um, they have uh, the, a need to authenticate and be able to, to get things done when often many communications uh, facilities are out of service. And that's a, that's a significant problem in, uh, in the federal space particularly. <clears throat> so we have in, in 63B, that, that middle bottom document, um, we have nine different types of what we call authenticators. Now, um, we, we chose the term authenticator, I think in the past versions of the document it was called a token, you know, which people think of as, you know, that's oh, one of those physical things that you, uh, that you carry around that, uh, that helps you to authenticate. I've got one of these, in, you know, like one of these things that you carry around and gives you a one-time password. Um, but we had actually applied the term token to things like um, passwords and so forth as well, and that was a little bit confusing. Besides which, all of the people that are using federation and assertions use the word token in a completely different way. So we picked a different word. So, so these are authenticators now. And we have nine types. There are what, six bullets here, but there's 
I'm counting single and multi-factor um, authenticators as two. So um, I'll be going through each of these, spending a lot of time on memorized secrets and a little bit of time on each of the others in order to discuss some of their usability characteristics and some of the things that we've done in order to try and improve that. The other term that we um, use a lot is authentication factors. Uh, there are three authentication factors, um, and you may have, you know, when people talk about two-factor authentication, it means you use two different of these, something you know, which is a password, something that you have, which is something like this uh, device in my pocket, and, um, uh, but it could also be your phone, it could also be uh, something that's uh, installed maybe even so software or hardware on your laptop. It could be a lot of things that, that, you, that you have. <clears throat> and something that you are, which is a, a biometric, some measurement of you, like a fingerprint or an iris or a lot of other things as well. Uh, maybe your typing cadence is fairly unique. That's a, a kind of an emerging um, topic of, of research is the, you know, being able to use things like that in order to, uh, in order to authenticate. And, and how good of a job can you do with that? So, so let's start with the memorize secrets. And, and here, this is a kind of a very generic term that we picked in order to avoid, uh, in order to be inclusive of passwords, passphrases, pins, you know, all of the other the other things that people use. We want to encourage people, you know, passphrases is great because it sort of gives the idea that, that, it's, that it's a longer thing, which is good from a security standpoint. But honestly, shorter things are in some applications acceptable too. So passwords and pins. So we're just using memorized secrets as the term. I'll probably use memorized secrets and passwords interchangeably like I did in the first bullet here. <clears throat> um, so passwords are the most common authenticators, of course. Um, you've all acknowledged that you've got lots of them. Um, how many people really like passwords? Not seeing a lot of hands here. OK. So I guess I, guess I validated the second bullet here. Um, <clears throat> they're also relatively weak. Um, there are a lot of things that contribute to the weakness of passwords. One is that people don't have the, the mental capabilities to choose a really good, complex, difficult to guess password and keep it memorized. And, and that's what's, what they're typically being asked to do. The other, the other problem with, with passwords is, is that they can be, uh, they can be replayed. You know, you, somebody is, that's able to key log your password can get a hold of that password. There are various attacks on um, sites that, that store passwords to try and extract that information, even if it's in a hashed form. You can do dictionary attacks and various offline attacks, and they've gotten very, very sophisticated. <clears throat> password, my personal opinion is that passwords are going to be around, though. You, you hear all of these sentiments like, oh, we got to kill the password, or we've got this product that's going to kill the password. And the, the difficulty is, if a password is the only something you know authenticator, then does that mean that, the, that if you need to do two-factor authentication, then those factors have to be something that you have and something that you are? Because that's all that's left. And there are advantages to passwords even from a legal standpoint where you can't be in, in now I'm not a lawyer, but in many legal regimes, you can't be compelled to reveal a password, but you could be perhaps compelled to present your fingerprint. So these are all things that are, um, so even though passwords are not that wonderful, they have some unique advantages. <clears throat> One of the things that I wanted to mention, though, is that 
and this is a change in, in this revision of the document, is that so-called security questions, things like what's the name of your first pet, what's your high school mascot, all of those sorts of things, we don't consider acceptable for authentication anymore. Yes, you're still going to find it on websites and, and so forth, and we all have to live with that. Uh, there's a quick clarifying question. Oh, Les, won't you share it with us? Okay. So I recently read that a past phrase of uh, some certain number of words is easy to remember and actually as good as some of the bizarro passwords with exclamation points and mixtures of numbers and whatever. Um, can you comment on that? Uh, past phrases generally are good. Uh, generally, the, the one thing that seems to be a, a constant is that whatever you do in order to make it longer makes it more secure. So if it's a, if it's passphrase, it's probably longer. And you know, even though it may be made up of words, just don't use correct horse battery staple because that was in a cartoon. But um, is, if, if, whatever you do in order to make the phrase longer, uh, or in order to make the password longer, is, is beneficial. It makes, it makes the job harder for, for cracking the offline passwords in particular. So, yeah, that's, that's one thing that's, that, that's good. Um, security questions, we don't want people to use security questions because they're often easy to discover. You can find, probably find out my high school mascot's name on Facebook if you look at what high school group I belong to. Uh, <coughs> You can probably guess a lot of the first pet names. Uh, we talked about trying to, to you know, have huge numbers of possibilities of passwords and so forth. But pet names, there's probably a thousand that cover most of the common pet names. And that's, that's not such good odds as compared with more secure passwords. And and one of the really important rules with passwords is not to reuse the same password at multiple sites. But your pet name, unless you're cheating, like a lot of us advocate, and, and putting fake pet names in, your pet name is the same. And if you have two different sites that ask for your pet name, a lot of people just kind of answer the question the same way both times. And uh, it makes the it makes the overall security quite a bit lower if one of one or the other of those get breached um, was there no, another question um, some of these we sh it might be easier if we held toward the end but I'm happy to do it either way uh, oh well since I have the microphone um, go for it I'm just curious whether there's been any study of the security people who cook up all these requirements and what they do with their authentication online? Because I doubt that they can do it themselves. I think that's probably true. <laughs> a, a lot of security people I know, when they're, when they're faced with security questions, they make up something random and just make sure that they have it stored securely someplace. And you know, they won't use Fido as their, as their first pet's name, for sure. <clears throat> so here are a few of the things I mentioned that, that we were factoring in usability into the requirements uh, for authentication. And so here's an example of some of the things that we've done with, with memorized secrets in order to try and make them more usable. First one is composition rules. These are the rules about, you know, you've got to have an uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, a digit, a special character, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> There's been a lot of research on these, and it's been found that they do, they, they add a lot more to frustration than they do to actual security. If somebody is, if somebody starts with the, the password, password, they said, oh, well, you need, a, you, need to cap, you need to have a capital letter there. Some large percentage will capitalize the first P. If, if then they're told, well, you also have to have a digit, then they're likely to make it password one. And if they're required to have a special character, they'll put an exclamation point on the end. 
Well, guess what? All of the people that are cracking passwords know this. They know, they know those tricks and they know almost anything that you can think of that might be a, that might be a clever trick, they have probably thought of as well. So people say, well, gee, maybe I'll just change the E's to 3's and the T's to 7's and do these kind of leet speak things. Well, I hate to tell you, but there are leet speak transforms in the password cracking programs that will try those specific things with, you know, earlier in the search path than they, than they would otherwise. So it, the, 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 the composition rules are really just kind of getting people mad and not helping security. And so what we want to do is we want to move <coughs> the responsibility for some of these security things from the user to the, the, to the service and impose stronger requirements on how the, the, the hash password is stored, uh, what, what kind of protection is done there in order to uh, avoid having, having the password breaches that have been all too common lately. Uh, we want to allow all kinds of printing characters. Um, none of these, well, you can't use a single apostrophe because that's just not allowed. Why not? Um, what it, we want to, we, we don't, part of the cognitive burden for users is trying to keep track of all of these silly rules. And so we're trying to get rid of as many of the rules as possible. <clears throat> Allowing Unicode characters. This is really directed at people who speak language, native languages other than English. Some people might find that the, it's easier to remember a password if it's typed in Cyrillic. Other people might want it in Chinese. Um, allowing, allowing Unicode uh, lets people create a, member, a memorable password, and that's the, that's the point here is to, that passwords be memorable in whatever, their lang whatever language they're comfortable with. By the way, this also allows people to create emoji passwords, which is fine, it's not really the intent, but a lot of people are having fun with emoji passwords too. <coughs> and, and very long maximum length. Why should a password be limited to 16 or 20 characters maximum? Um, we recommend that they allow at least 64. And the only reason we kind of stopped at 64 is because pretty soon it gets to be an enormous block on the screen and, uh, and uh, inconvenient to, uh, inconvenient to uh, look at. <clears throat> so instead of the composition rules, we wanted to do something in order to avoid the really common password one exclamation point or something like that, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, because those are still a vulnerability if, if they're allowed. So what we're recommending is a blacklist, that there be some list of common passwords that if you choose one of those when you're setting your password, the site says, I'm sorry, that's a common password. You need to pick a different one. Now, there's a lot of controversy about, well, how big should it be? Is it good enough to have 10 of those, 100 of those? Or I've seen recommendations of like millions and millions of these. In fact, people have been started putting together corpuses of every password that's ever been seen in any breach, um, which is millions if not billions. <clears throat> and the difficulty is if the, if the blacklist is too short, you end up allowing too many weak passwords. If the blacklist is too long, you end up with users that are frustrated because they're going to guess password after password or try password after password and find out that they're all not allowed. And they're just going to start doing the equivalent of putting an exclamation point at the end or two or three or you know, just, just doing crazy things that are probably very predictable because we frustrated them. Um, and as the bottom bullet says, frustrated users make bad choices. So from a security standpoint, we really want something in the middle here. And I've done a little bit of looking at this and I'm, my personal opinion is that maybe a, a hundred thousand common passwords is a good number or something like that. In this, in this database, 
<clears throat> so that we aren't allowing passwords that are too weak, but at the same time, users have a fighting chance of, of guessing something that isn't likely, uh, uh, isn't likely to be in the list already. The, the difficulty with this, of course, is it's not, very, it's not a very transparent thing. We can't say, okay, uh, you know, don't, don't do the following things and your password will be fine. Um, you, could, you could pick something that seems like a reasonable password, but maybe it's a common password for some reason you haven't thought of. Maybe you know, there are some, some passwords that are common because they are, represent nice, easy geometric sequences on a keyboard, for example. QWERTY is, of course, a, a very common password. <coughs> So, um, a different thing. Um, very often, when people are entering passwords, there is nobody looking over their shoulder. There's nobody even in the same room. However, every time you enter your password, it shows up as these little dots, right? <clears throat> That's really not helpful. Uh, you would like to be able to see what your password, see if you've typed your password. And, and have a better chance of doing it the first time rather than enter your password and no, it wasn't right, but I don't know what I did wrong, so I could just got to do it again. <clears throat> so uh, this was a recommendation from the, uh, from the NIST usability people is to have a little checkbox or something that says um, rather than the dots, there's nobody looking over my shoulder, so show me my password as I'm typing it. Uh, this really makes it a lot easier to do. And, and think especially about not just regular users, but perhaps people who have, have some difficulty typing because of a dis dexterity problem. This, this can really help a lot. And so, again, we're, we're, we're trying to, to cut down on the frustration that's associated with, with, with signing in on things. Um, I'm wondering if it should be a browser feature in the future. Um, it, it, it seems like something that, uh, uh, I haven't talked to any browser vendors about it, but it, it would seem like something that uh, it would be nice to have in a, in a centralized way there, um, rather, rather than to, to require every website to do that. <coughs> Pasting. Now, some of you may not have run into this, but there are sites that, um, they say, well, you know, you're not supposed to write down your password. You're not supposed to, like, keep it in a text file on your computer, all that sort of thing. So as a result, we want to make sure that somebody's really typing it. We don't want people to paste into that field. Isn't that good for security? Well, no, it's not. <laughs> it, <clears throat> for one thing, it disables password managers. And password managers are a little bit controversial um, for, for some. Uh, I personally use a password manager, and a lot of folks that are very focused on security that I know also do that. Um, but what, 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 you'd like to, what you'd like to be able to do is to paste a password into the field if that's what you want to do. It, it's, it's, it's kind of counterproductive to, to block pasting. And, and by the way, one of the reasons that, that password managers are arguably good is that they really encourage people to come up with more secure passwords. Uh, it's easier to have a longer, more complex, it can gen many of these can, most of these can generate a password for you that's better than something that you can come up with yourself and overall helps security. So we are discouraging this practice of blocking pasting. Now, I've been talking all this time about memorized secrets, passwords, but they're fundamentally have, they fundamentally have limitations in how secure they are, and that's a lot of the reason that we talk so much about two-factor authentication, is because you would like to have both something that demonstrates who you are, but also something that is more secure, that, that kind, of, kind of bolsters that, and, and requires complementary skills in order to try and break. So if somebody has the ability to, you know, get, gets a hold of the, the, uh, the hash password file from a site and is able to crack those passwords, 
By the way, when they crack those passwords, the first thing that they do is they go around to like all of the banks and all of that in order to see if you've used the same password in multiple places. So that's part of the reason that using the same password is really bad. And, and maybe that you want to use a, a password manager or something like that is that um, it's this practice of going around and you know when they crack a password, trying it every place else, and perhaps getting in using that to leverage into other things that's really dangerous. <clears throat> Anyhow, two-factor authentication presents the attacker now with both the ability, both the necessity of cracking either a password or a biometric, and also a, a cryptographic key that's stored on some other medium. And I'll be talking about a bunch of those. So um, by, by doing something complementary, we, we improve security. But what we want to do, since we're requiring that the user do two things now, we don't want to make it that much. We don't want to make it twice as hard as passwords. So I'll go through these in no particular order, other than this is the order that they're in the document. Um, one of these is lookup secrets. And you probably, you, or you may very well have seen these on, on some sites where they'll give you the opportunity to, to print out some backup codes for authenticating at the website if you forget your password or if you lose your, your, your cryptographic token or, or something of that sort. Um, it's just something that they, they generate these, they store these. You can print them out and store them in your strong box or something like that. And hopefully you don't need them. But the idea here is that these are really well suited to account recovery sorts of things. They're cheap. They're easy to generate. Um, fairly easy to use. I mean, you still have to transcribe these values over. And hopefully, these. Th this one's pretty nice. They're in a typeface that you can distinguish the ones from the Ls. So that's good. Um, <coughs> But what, what, you, what you want is something that's, that, that's cheap and easy for occasional use. And, and occasional use because each of these is good only once. After you've authenticated, what is it, 10 times here, this list of one-time passwords is no longer usable. You need to generate another one. You need to remember to do that. <clears throat> one thing that we're, that we're encouraging is that services provide lots of different ways to authenticate. And you might say, well, OK, that gives more opportunities for uh, an attacker to break. You know, Any one of these can get into my account. And that's true. But the real weakness for a lot of accounts, or a lot of services, has been the account recovery process. What do you do when somebody forgets their password? What do you do when somebody loses their token, their physical authenticator that they use to sign in. We want to have a better answer to that. And the answer to that is to give people multiple ways to get in so that they have a backup. And then we can make the account recovery process more onerous. Maybe they have to go and sort of repeat some of this enrollment that they had done originally in order to reestablish who they are. But we can, we can, make, the, we can make the account overall more secure by having multiple authenticators. And this is, this is one that would probably be issued uh, primarily, as a, primarily as a backup authenticator. <clears throat> uh, Out-of-band authenticators. And I, I suspect most of you have run into these. Uh, this is when you sign into, in my example here, this was PayPal. Um, sign into PayPal. And because I have two-factor authentication set up, it sends me a text message uh, with a code that I need to type in that's valid for, for five minutes. Um, it, it's helpful. It, it, it definitely improves security. But you have to consider that if, I, if I'm up in the mountains where we don't have cell phone service, I might not be able to get that text message. And therefore, I might not be able to use PayPal. That's kind of something I have to, have to accept right now. But that's, that's a limitation of this. Uh, you've got the same issue with transcription. 
And, and in this case, you've got a time limit on it. So that means if you've got uh, somebody with a, um, uh, a disability, they might have a little bit of difficulty completing the task in the allotted time. Uh, and from a security standpoint, we're actually trying to, to discourage the use of the cell phone network or the telephone network in general uh, because of a bunch of vulnerabilities there, uh, such as the ability for somebody to come and claim that they're you at the cell phone store and say, well, I lost my cell phone. I need to buy a new cell phone and, and get my phone number reestablished on it. They've just stolen your phone number, which is the place that you receive your, your uh, second factor authentication. That's actually happening a fair amount. And uh, it's a concern that we have because it's, it's something that's rising. Um, uh, a lot of you have, have probably uh, used these devices as well. This is, uh, uh, we, we call them OTP devices, but it's, uh, OTP stands for, for one-time password. What it does is it generates, um, in this case, a, a six-digit number that you read off of the device. It changes every 30 seconds. So you have to take this six-digit number and enter it on the website or application that you're authenticating at. And it's actually good for a little longer than 30 seconds. I don't know exactly how much time because the clock in here isn't always perfectly synchronized. It has to be you know, well enough synchronized for, for several years of, of use. But again, you've got the issue of somebody maybe with a, with a, a, a vision problem. These are, these are fairly small devices. and. Uh, Maybe, maybe hard to read, maybe hard to get the, the number typed in within the allotted time before they time out. This is a, here's a different style. This one isn't, isn't uh, time-based, I don't think, but it, you push a button and it, and it gives you a six-digit number. <clears throat> so that's a reasonable authenticator, um, but you know, it, does, it does have limitations for certain classes of users. Um, there's a multi-factor version of it, which is very much the same, except that you have to type a pin in on the little keyboard here in order to get your authenticator output. Uh, that's really good because it th th means this whole thing is the two-factor authentication. Um, you don't have to use this necessarily with a password in order to do two-factor authentication. The two factors are, are right here. So you've proven both something that you know and you've proven that you have that device, um, which is great, except you need to, to type the pin on a, on a fairly small device. Some users might have a problem with that. And then there are uh, cryptographic uh, uh, authenticators. And these are generally sort of like challenge response protocols that are, that are done with, in this case, software authenticators that are done with a certificate, typically, that a user certificate that you, that you have in, say, your browser. Um, and and it, could, it could also have a passphrase. So this could be a two-factor authentication as well. Um, but these haven't been very popular. The, the process for getting these and getting these installed in your device is really not straightforward. It's especially not straightforward if you want that whole process to itself be two-factor authenticated. One of the things that we're trying to avoid is the ability of somebody to take a single factor authentication and leverage it into something that seems like two-factor. We, we would like it to be two-factor all the way from the point where you, you go through the enrollment process, you're given two-factor authentication, and then you can derive other two-factor from that, but you don't want it to be, uh, you don't want a situation where somebody can just use maybe a username and a password and get something that, claim, get something that is normally a two-factor authenticator. <clears throat> um, these need to be organized. If you're using, these haven't had a lot of use, but if, if they did, you, it's difficult to keep these straight because they're kind of an intangible thing that's in your, uh, that, that you're in your browser and you need to figure out which one is used for, for which site. Um, 
Then there are these so-called single factor cryptographic devices. And these come in, in a lot of different styles, but uh, I mean, generally it's, it's one of these things that it uh, uh, plugs into a USB port and uh, there's, a, there's a protocol that runs um, and sends a challenge to this device. You have to tap it in order to prove that you're there. That's a really good characteristic, by the way, with what we refer to as, as user intent. We don't want, if somebody has an infected computer, we don't want an authenticator that's plugged into that computer to be leveraged by whatever malware is running there. We want the fact that the user is authenticating to be a conscious physical act. So uh, this, this has, that, has that characteristic, which is really nice. Um, it does require a USB port. So I have a little bit of a problem if I want to try and use this with my phone. There isn't a USB port here. So this is an example of, of something that's, that, that's really quite good, but it has some availability limitations that you can't use it all of the places that you would like to be able to use it. Oh, and, and from a, more from a usability standpoint, this is something I run into at home because I have my Linux machine underneath the desk way, way down under. When I want to use this on my Linux machine, I basically have to climb under the desk and push the button, which I can do, but somebody in a wheelchair might have a, have a little more difficulty. Or maybe the USB port is on the back. You run into that too. And then there's multi-factor cryptographic devices. This is, a, this is a smart card that contains an embedded a secret, so it can do uh, very much the same thing as the software certificates can. Uh, and uh, what you do is you enter a PIN code uh, in order to effectively unlock the use of this device and, the, uh, and, and then it can uh, uh, authenticate for you. So the, the entering of the PIN code is uh, some of the intent, although it's a little bit inconsistent in, in its uh, experience. Um, but again, you need to have a USB port with an adapter or maybe some specialized port in order to, in order to use that. I, I can't use it with my phone once again. <clears throat> now, a lot of people point at biometrics as kind of the, the great hope in, in terms of authentication. B biometrics have some usability issues as well. Uh, I find, for example, that when I've been working out in the garden, that I can't unlock my phone with my finger because my finger's kind of dirty and rough and dry, and uh, it won't read my fingerprint properly. I have the same problem when I wash the dishes. My uh, fingers are wet, uh, extra wet and soft and so forth. It doesn't read the fingerprint properly there. You need to reproduce the conditions of enrollment, basically. Um, also, you have to remember which finger you used, which I, I'm fairly consistent about that, but you know, some people might use different fingers in different places. Uh, lighting conditions, if, it's, uh, if, if we're talking about maybe uh, iris or uh, face recognition, things like that. Uh, facial expression, um, uh, a friend was talking about having gotten a, uh, an iPhone 10 uh, and uh, wasn't this great. Uh, she wouldn't have to take off her gloves in order to unlock the phone when she's skiing. And I think that's true, but she might have to take off her goggles. I haven't heard the answer to that, whether she needs to or not. <coughs> um, and and there, there are people for whom the, some of these modalities don't work very well. I mean, there are, I don't remember what exactly... Um, uh, professions, uh, there are some people that just wear their fingerprints down due to, due to what they do during the day. And uh, so some of, these, some of these modalities won't work for them. You know, maybe, they're, maybe they're blind and they're, they're, uh, uh, they don't have a, have a usable iris and, and so forth. So these are, while these are generally considered convenient to use, they do have some limitations in terms of in terms of where they can be used. And, and I, I generally consider that if you're using a biometric, you also need another way of getting in because uh, 
it, it just w it just wouldn't be adequate to uh, you know have to have to wait until my fingers come back to normal after gardening or something like that. <clears throat> the other issue is in, in uh, more about security than usability. There are some limitations on the accuracy of biometrics, and um, you know it would be a lot better. You know we we have to put limitations on how many tries you get before the the device locks up. Those of you that have uh, phones with, with biometric unlock features have probably run into this, that if you try too many times, it'll start saying, it'll start, start slowing you down or, or something like that. That's because uh, of the possibility that, uh, it's because the biometrics aren't, aren't perfect in, in uh, distinguishing good guys from bad guys. And so, uh, Biometrics I consider generally as a, as a nice convenience feature, but something that you need to have other ways of getting in as well. So what I hope that you'll take away from this is that there isn't one perfect authenticator that you can use in all situations. We have a nice set of nine or so that are good for different situations, and it's helpful to have more than one of those. We're really trying to encourage services to offer more than one way to authenticate, and we're trying to encourage services to allow more than one way for a, a particular user to authenticate so that they can enroll multiple authenticators uh, into their account uh, to use under different circumstances. So, this has all been about the process of signing into an account. And what I'd like to touch on briefly is the other volume, the, the, the 800-63A volume, uh, which deals with enrollment and identity proofing. Because there's a, there's a usability aspect to that as well, but it's different from what it is. You have different sorts of trade-offs than you have with authentication. So in authentication, we're concerned because people are going to be doing this all the time and it needs to be reasonable for that kind of a situation. In the case of identity proofing, we're really concerned with what's perhaps a one-time or at best, at, at worst rather, a very infrequent process to establish or reestablish who you are. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to establish that a particular online account belongs to, let's say, me as an individual. Um, we do have, you know, we're, we're trying to make account recovery more secure, so we're actually saying that if you lose all of your authenticators, you should repeat a little bit of this in order to reestablish who you are, rather than go through some of these pretty hokey processes that are, that are often used if you forget your password or you, you lose another authenticator. Uh, there are both, and, and the, the document goes into this in all sorts of detail, uh, both in-person and remote methods for uh, identity proofing. Of course, in-person is quite a bit more secure uh, because you can actually see the person and you have all of the, all of the fidelity uh, you can examine their, the evidence that they brought in order to see whether the, you know, make sure that the driver's license really looks real or the pass, passport really looks real. Um, although, actually, things are getting better in terms of the evidence where some of them are getting chips and so forth that, you know, we can electronically verify that remotely a lot better than we used to be able to. <clears throat> um, so, as I mentioned, we're a lot less sensitive to convenience because this is not happening as often. But we're very sensitive to accessibility. Uh, think about the situation with the, uh, the homeless folks that need VA services, for example. And that, that's not the only one. But um, you could have um, one of the things that's sometimes required as part of the enrollment process is that you know, we'll mail you an, an enrollment code in order to verify the address that you gave. Um, some of these people don't have addresses, and we need to figure out how to, how to address that. Uh, 
also a situation that I, that I, I ran into in a in meeting that I had today was there are situations where we need to do identity proofing for people that aren't U.S. citizens or aren't even resident in the United States. Um, the uh, FAA needs to accredit pilots that, that work for foreign airlines or uh, believe the USDA has inspectors overseas that are foreign nationals and they need to do identity proofing because those inspectors are going to need to be able to authenticate themselves in order to submit a report about an inspection, let's say. So these are all issues that, that uh, we're, we're trying to cover in the different ways and we're pro providing as much flexibility as we can and still learning more about the the, the challenges that people have uh, with identity proofing and, and trying to come up with something that's both accessible to all of the people that need it and um, still secure enough that, uh, that it can't be exploited. So that was basically what I had to talk about this evening and um, I hope that resonates with you, with you all and I'd be happy to take any questions. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one pervasive issue it seems to me is that the authentication or proofing is actually kind of a two-way street and where this came up for me was I was considering opening, uh, getting another Bitcoin wallet at another provider because it had a certain feature that I wanted and then I wasn't familiar with them, you know, they had some internet rep but and going through the process was exactly like the you know, dream of an identity thief, right? It was, you know, give us your bank account number, give us your phone number and your address, and <clears throat> I don't think they asked for a social security number, that would have been probably a dead giveaway, but you know, if I completed that process, they would be well equipped. So how would I know, and what kind of systems can we put in place to sort of authenticate the authenticators? Uh, excellent question, because that's, uh, that's gotten to be a significant issue when, when there are, when there are so, many, so many providers and you know a lot of them are, are legitimate. They're, they're small merchants that are, that are just sort of trying to, trying to do business. Um, you know, we buy glow necklaces for Halloween um, from a little provider in Massachusetts and you know the question is how do you, how do you make sure that, 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 uh, that they're legitimate and not, not some sort of a party in the middle. And, and really the answer in, is, is what we re refer to as you know, some sort of accreditation where um, you would have some sort of a, a, a third party that, that, that people trust. Think of the good housekeeping seal, but it's probably not good housekeeping anymore. Um, that, um, that, that could be used in order to establish that they're, uh, uh, that they're a legitimate uh, uh, entity. And uh, there's been a lot of work in that direction. There's, uh, there was another initiative called the, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace that, that uh, talked about creating what we called an identity ecosystem. Uh, and the idea was to be able to establish a framework for doing, for doing this kind of accreditation. It's really an unsolved problem. There are a few solutions out there, like you see the, you know, the, the so-called extended validation uh, SSL certificates, you know, with the little green padlock and the name of the company next to it and so forth. That's imperfect too because that tells you maybe that the corporation that, it, the name of the corporation that got the certificate, but it doesn't tell you anything about whether they're good practice, whether they adhere to good practices or not. So. Yes. It's routine for websites to require you to create an account in order to buy something, um, even if you have no intention of ever coming back there again. It's a one-time thing, but we want you to create an account, presumably so that they can market to you. Mm -hmm. um, as a designer, I tell clients all the time, do not do that. This is insane. Uh, your business level will drop precipitously precisely because you're requiring an account. Um, and uh, 
part of the rationale there is that some people just don't want no stinking account. Some people are um, don't want to give you their password because they're using it 50 other places. As soon as they give it to you, you now have their password to go use in the other 49. But I don't have any data to back that up. I have anecdotal indications. Is there any place with data about you know, how many people use password as their password? How many people add a one at the end of it? How many people add an exclamation point? How many people decline? That kind of thing that we kind of know from lore, is there any place with data to reinforce that? There's a lot of data about, about breach passwords because there's been a lot of research done on it. Uh, there are folks that publish corpuses of breached passwords. Um, they generally don't say where this password was used, but you, you can get you know, kind of frequency characteristics of, uh, um, and I, I can point you at, at some of the sites afterwards if you want, um, frequency characteristics of, of you know, how many passwords, how many, time, how many occurrences of a particular password there were in their whole, their whole database and so forth. In terms of trying to measure the reuse of passwords, that's been quite a bit harder to do because it, it, it re would require that you, re that you associate the password with the reuse by the same person. Um, it's, it's very common for two different people to have the same password. But what I, I think the question that you were asking at the beginning had to do with the use of a password by uh, a single password or by, you know, in, on, on several different sites. And we don't, I haven't seen a whole lot of data about that, but we know that, we know that the practice is fairly common because, you know, we all have friends that we've talked to that say, oh, sure, I do that. Or, you know, maybe I have a, uh, I have a, a low security password that I use for all of the places that, that are maybe just social networking sites or, or, you know, support forums or, or whatever. Um, and you know, pe pe people do that fairly commonly. Um, again, this is, this is a, an argument in favor of password managers and so forth that make it easy to avoid that problem. I have a, another answer to your question, which is not so much about the password, but about when in the process to ask someone to make an account, right? And I think that both Jared Spool and Jacob Nielsen have talked to this issue and said, put it late in the process, like even at the very end after they've made the purchase and say, now would you like to make that into a, an account? And so you allow guests check out and you'll get a lot more um, uptake with that. And I think you could do that even as an A-B experiment with your folks just to prove it to them. Have some small percentage have to make a password and the rest be able and see what your uptake in purchases is without having to, being forced to, compelled to pr create an account. Uh, I wrote an article once in UX Magazine about that sort of thing, but it, w it was more specifically about the fact that you're intercepting people at all. Uh, they say, buy now, and you intercept them with create an account, guest checkout, and the, the article was that the very presence of that intercept itself is going to drop you precipitously, never mind holding it to later. Yes. It, it, it's part of the overall, it, it creates transaction friction, which is you know, something that, that they try to avoid. And, you know, but but they're, they're sort of trying to trade off here the possible loss of a transaction through friction versus retention of the customer through additional marketing and people make different decisions about that. I just said in the article, do the arithmetic. Quantify the bump that you get from your marketing, quantify the loss that you're getting because of that intercept and compare the numbers. Yeah. Data-driven decision making, yeah, we're for it. I, I'm seeing that puzzled look, sure. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it occurs to me that for most people, for most uses, any of the methods you 
proposed that are in use would be protection enough unless you use the same password everywhere then I think you're vulnerable to be hacked if someone gets it once they'll get it across the board but two things password managers Cracking one of those would be cracking the mother load, wouldn't it? I mean, today, for the first time, Norton popped up with a screen saying, would you like us to manage your passwords? So if you trust Norton, but then what, how does Norton protect that, or how does Apple protect that with its password manager, or how does Mozilla Firefox protect those password managers? Cracking one of those would be the mother load right for any hacker so <laughs> see all these data breaches where where the information is consolidated that's where the protection needs to be and no none of us have any idea what protections there are and like for example and we hear these numbers like uber a uh, hundred thousand uh, people or target 40 million or the one that really disturbed me was, I think, Equifax, one of the credit generating companies. 143 million passwords or, or accounts were, were cracked. 20 years ago or so, there's like 350 million people in the United States or 325, uh, they're, but they're, in terms of households, there were 90 million. So now there are probably about 130 million households in the United States. That is, people who have income coming in either by government transfer funds or by employment. So in other words, whoever hacked Equifax has all of it. Mm -hmm. Every one of us, every household. We don't really kind of get the staggering numbers of these things. So it's almost as if at that level, the security ought to be like nuclear codes. There ought to be two people having to put in independently different passwords and turning a key but I don't know, and nobody knows except them, what safeguards there are at that level, the level that really matters. And, and that's, that's the difficulty with so much of this, is oftentimes, like in the case of Equifax, a lot of people probably didn't know what data Equifax had on them. And so when the, the Equifax breach came along, um, then you know, there were an awful lot of people that were surprised. The same, I mean, the big one in the federal government was the Office of Personnel Management that, that lost uh, an awful lot of very personal data on federal employees. And so, I mean, some of the challenges there in terms of, you know, kind of, the, and it's a real dilemma. Do you, cent do you centralize things and, and really secure it like crazy? Or do you, do you tend to kind of distribute things to, to, to limit your losses? And I guess one of the reasons, and, and I really didn't mean to be launching into a sales pitch for password managers here, but whatever you use, you, you sort of need to think about how they make their money, um, whether, whether uh, uh, keeping your data secure is something that is vital to keeping them in business or not. And in the case of, you know, say Equifax, uh, it wasn't actually, Usernames and passwords. It was just data about people, and you know there. Social security numbers, although, yeah. That's the key yeah. to the kingdom, isn't it? Well, it shouldn't be, but it is, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about about uh, trying to use social security number as less of an authenticator and more of just an identifier, more of a, you know, uh, something that, that that just kind of distinguishes different people from each other, as opposed to necessarily proving that if you know this nine digit number that you're a particular person. So, um, but you know, the, you know, it's, the, it's, it's always this dilemma of, of do you concentrate the data and really protect, really, really watch that one gateway, or do you kind of distribute things around? And there's different kinds of losses also, I mean, banks, People, people worry, you know, think about, well, banks, of course, are going to have really great security. Well, in the case of a bank, most of the time, you can remediate a bank loss by throwing money at it. You can just 
make, make, the, make the user whole again, r restore the funds that were siphoned off of their account, and you're done. It's pretty easy to be done. It might not be cheap, but, it's, but it's, it's very straightforward. You can't say the same thing for losses of personal information. You know, medical information that gets breached or, or other, other reputational sorts of things. Um, think about the, well, in any case, um, there are a lot of those things that, that are much harder to, you know, what is the, what is the remedy for revealing that, uh, you know, revealing the, the, the list of a number of, the list of, of a number of people that are maybe HIV infected or something like that. That would be terrible. And um, so financial losses aren't the only thing that we need to consider. Bill. Just to couple of follow-ons to that. I mean, if you look at the password managers out there, some of them make a point of not centralizing any of the information. You know, you provide a master passphrase that encrypts something that you own and maintain. The downside, of course, being that uh, you're potentially one disk crash away from losing that database, unless you distribute it somehow. But the upside being there is no central place for all that data to be hacked, right? So that's good. And that's, I think, especially important when you consider that both, as my understanding, Equifax and Uber were real amateur hour, you know, things, right? I mean, the, the, the level of non-protection was appalling, right? And, and I think in Ubers, it was this classic operational thing of the passwords were stored out in the uh, cloud system that, you know, was running the software. And in Equifax, we all know they were just, like, not installing security patches. So I don't know what we do about that as a society, but somehow you have to hold these orgs to a standard, and especially a standard that matches the level of the importance of the data they've got. But I don't know what that is. Yeah. I don't know what that mechanism. They Criminal charges, perhaps? Well, or, 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 or more liability for them. But of yeah. course, they, fight, they, they lobby against that. So um, you have a question? Sure. I'll, I have one after you. Um, Really great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I, you mentioned earlier, actually, um, those recovery questions are not allowed or something. Yes. But I, I do find them a lot, especially in bank banking institutions. Mm -hmm. So you know, say you manage to forget your password, and you just have to answer like three questions. And they're usually about you, you know, things that maybe close friends would know. Um, so I don't know, like, is, is it not allowed in terms of this standard, or? It's, it's not allowed in terms of this standard, and, and, okay. and you know, there's actually a, a period of time, I think, until next summer or something like that, that federal agencies have to, have to become compliant with it. And NIST, of course, doesn't have a police force that goes out and, and, and arrests people who still <laughs> have security questions <clears throat> after that. So um, the... Um, uh, you know, basically what we're trying to do, given the fact that this standard is looked at by a lot of other industries, by international standards bodies and by, by uh, you know, financial standards bodies and so forth, we're trying to lead here by saying this isn't acceptable for government use and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the implication is and you shouldn't use them either. But right. in fact, you're going you're gonna to run into them for a long period of time and so am I. Right. I mean, uh, you do need a recovery, you know, uh, method. Right. So uh, if you have, you know, other suggestions, maybe that would be. Well, the, the um, uh, one list of one printed one-time passwords okay. that you print out, that was one recommendation. But the other thing is just to have you know, a couple different ways of getting into your account. Maybe you've got both, you know, one of these uh, one-time password devices but mm -hmm. just in case it gets run over by a car, you've got, you know, a, another authenticator. You need to have just multiple ways of getting in. And really, this, that's all the security questions are, is they're kind of another set of really weak passwords. Um, so rather than having another set of really weak passwords, we're suggesting that you have multiple authenticators that are stronger. Okay. And... Um yeah, I, I wanted to also ask, and it's a follow-up to this idea of, you know, um, having these the centralized s 
space where all your information is stored. Um, I guess you mentioned there's um, earlier accredit uh, um, what's it called or accreditation organizations that it's you know maybe small businesses can use in order to be more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, is there some kind of body that? could be in that mo with it, like used as that model for you know password managers I don't know of a body that does that um, and I, I'm not going to you know recommend a specific password manager or managers but the the best thing to do is to you know do due diligence on on mm -hmm. the ones that you see on the market you know look at some of the reviews uh, try and find out what some of the security experts out there are are using themselves, and uh, that that's probably the probably the best bet is to, you know, just just shop for a password manager like you would shop for another high value thing that you buy. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to ask a pragmatic question, and I see we have one other thought here before we close out, and that is. The people in this room are likely working in companies where they are uh, usability or a user experience uh, professional, or maybe you're a developer or some kind of other security person. How can we advocate in our organizations for improved authentication? Well, I guess one thing is in your own organizations, if you see that your own organization is doing something that's not usable from, you know, as, as, as we've talked about it here. Uh, now you know about the recommendations from NIST on how authentication can be done in a more usable way. You know about these documents and you can point at them and, and reference them. Is there a um, Reader's Digest version of the documents that would get people started? You know, you, you know the bite snack meal model? That's coming, actually. We're in the process of working on what we refer to as a set of implementation guides mm -hmm. that, that really is you know, not a set of, you know, thou shalt do this and not do that, but really a sort of set of guides that kind of lead people into this more. Those are still under development now. Uh, I expect those will come out sometime in, in 2018. We'll probably have a, a public comment process on it to, before that happens. Will undoubtedly have have a public comment process on it, but the idea is to do exactly what you're suggesting. So there isn't an infographic available yet, right? Or uh, four of them, one for each volume. <laughs> no, we're getting there, and and we're we're doing actually we're developing the documents on GitHub, so um, you know you can you can sort of watch the sausage as it's made there if you want. Hey. All right. I think all of us have a feeling that we're harassed by the constant requests for new passwords. We're just pushed up against it by them. And so here's the tinfoil hat or the black helicopter type question. The, <laughs> the solution, the dreaded solution possibly is to have something embedded in one's body like they do with dogs, right? Those little chips mm -hmm. that could track us, that we could walk in and flash our left hand in front of instead of a, of a card. Is NIST contemplating anything like that? And really what advantage is there in opening up your skin and putting one of those in as opposed <laughs> to having it on your keychain? Good provocative question to close with. <laughs> so in, in, in each of these volumes, in addition to usability considerations, we also have a chapter on privacy considerations. And um, you know, something like you're describing would be, you know, is, is very invasive for one thing, but I mean, would, would, would actually introduce some significant privacy considerations in terms of your ability not to authenticate if you didn't want to effectively. You know, it's like having your, your serial number tattooed on your arm or something like that. There isn't really a huge advantage of that over 
just having it in your pocket and, and available when you want it. You do, it doesn't have to be embedded under your skin. You don't wear women's clothes often enough. Where are the pockets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that, that's a solvable problem. Okay, good. <laughs> let's, let's thank Jim for coming tonight to Baycott. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for all the great questions. <laughs>